Okay, let me, let me first discuss a bit the context. Okay. Uh, you see this slide. Uh, the title is the engine of ICT. ICT, of course, stays for information and communication technology. And the engine of ICT, what enables all the applications in ICT, is the transistor. Okay. Uh, everything goes with the transistor, and this is the reason also because the, let's say the history is very, is very recent, actually. The, transistors, the transistor was invented in uh, uh, 1947 at the Bell Labs. Uh, the first uh, uh, semiconductor transistor. Of course, you know already what is a transistor. Uh, and it's useful as an amplifier for analog applications and as a controlled switch for digital applications. Before 1947, there was electronics, but the only electronics available was vacuum tube electronics. So we have these large tubes uh, that, they, that, that were basically very similar to, uh, to, to, to small lamps. Okay? And the circuits were very large, very um, power consuming, and expensive. Okay, but the technology was very advanced because uh, vacuum tubes were around since the, the the beginning of the century. Then in fourteen, then in nineteen forty-seven, it was almost forty years that vacuum tubes were available. So there was already a lot of stuff. There were radios, there were televisions, there was already the radar. And, uh, and uh, this uh, semiconductor electronics, the electronics based on semiconductors as this first transistor, uh, let's say, find, found a hard time in order to be accepted. It was very difficult because the performance of the vacuum tubes was better at the time. Okay. Then, gradually, things evolved and the performance of semiconductor electronics improved uh, largely. For example, in 1961, the first IC, which means the first integrated circuit, was fabricated. Um, and this changed everything, basically because this demonstrated the possibility of fabricating a complete circuit on a single silicon uh, tile, a small piece of silicon, okay? And, uh, and with, a, with a fabrication process which was very similar to printing. And, uh, <coughs> and there had I mean, provided the possibility of fabricating larger and larger circuits at a small cost. So everything changed in 61 from the point of view of the industrial application of semiconductor electronics. This uh, uh, picture here is the first integrated circuit. It was, an, uh, uh, it was basically an SRAM, so a six transistor SRAM, one bit, okay? Actually, the technology was extremely powerful because uh, it was possible to increase the numbers of transistors per chip every year, and then from 61 to, for example, 2010, we, we as, as humanity, let's say, were able to build a one billion transistor chip. This is an Intel processor, an i7, a Core i7, and it had one billion transistors. With a technology which was uh, 32 nanometer, we will talk a bit about what this number is and what does it mean. In the, in the meantime, the main thing that happened is that uh, uh, the, the transistors became very small. So the size of the die did not increase that much. 
the first I see was something like two millimeter by two millimeter, okay? The one billion transistor chip is something like 15 millimeter by 15 millimeter. So the increase in the number, in, in, in the area is pretty small, is a factor 50, okay? But the increase in uh, uh, number of transistors is a factor 100 million, okay? So the, which means, of course, that transistors have become extremely small, okay? This is a, a photograph, the, the one, uh, let's say, let me just use the pointer. This is um, a picture of this uh, one billion transistor chip. You can see uh, the density of the thing and the modularity. Well, it seems like a, a city from the above, okay? Uh, metropolitan city, more or less. And uh, of course, if you want to play with one billion transistor, you need to have some regularity because you cannot put them one by one, okay? We will go a bit into that, okay. Uh, so w what does it mean? That transistors are extremely small, okay? And uh, a transistor become, for example, smaller than a virus. This is something that sometimes strikes people. This is a, a, a cross-section of a MOSFET from, uh, uh, I would say, something like uh, six, seven years ago, okay? It's not uh, the most recent one. Uh, you, you can see this is the source contact, this is the drain contact, and this is the gate in the middle. Okay, you, you should recognize it easily. The channel length here is 35 nanometer, as the, and the channel length is the most important part of the, NFT, of the FET, as you know. If you take an influenza virus, they are more or less with a round shape, the diameter is 100 nano. So the difference is significant. And this is not really uh, um, one of the newest transistors. So what do we do with all these transistors? Because it was not easy. This is a, something that has been really, um, let's say, uh, that is easy to forget. At the beginning, there were circuits with one transistor, two transistors, six transistors. There is the one transistor radio, the six transistor radio, which was very advanced when the transistors came out. Now we have one billion transistors. What can we do with one billion transistors? Okay, just to, oh, you, you, you know this stuff, but just to give you an example, this is what you do with 3,000 transistors. This was what the consumer, what consumer electronics could, let's say, afford in 76. With uh, 3,000 transistors in a microprocessor, you can make uh, a game like Pong. I, you're probably too young to, to know about Pong, but there are some vintage games, websites where you can play with all this stuff. Basically, when I was a kid, I had Pong, okay? Uh, you, you connected it to the TV, you had two joysticks and you could play. And basically these uh, are two zeros the, 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 because the game ha has just started. You have to uh, um, it's something that r r reminds you of two rockets and you have a ball. Okay, it's extremely easy. You can do that with 3,000 transistors. Uh, and you have to be very careful about using as much as possible the possibilities you have, the capabilities, the computing capabilities you have. Of course, with 500 million transistors, you can, you, you, you can let's say, run um, a, a much more complex um, video game. So, uh, this was the, uh, the, the story. I have already gone through the, 
through these uh, uh, dates. 1947, the transistor was actually invented. 1948, uh, the news was, uh, uh, let's say, made public. And uh, this is a remake of the first transistors, the one on the, on the, um, uh, on the left. Okay, you, you see the same thing, the, the things as I do see that. And these are the three inventors. This is Bratain, this is Shockley, and no, so this is Bardeen, this is Shockley, and this is Bratain. They were at the Bell Labs, which was the telephone company, the main telephone company at the time. The, his, the, the, the story is nice because the telephone company did not know actually what to do with the transistor. They tried to use it, but actually the vacuum tube technology was much better. And so they had uh, several patents on, on transistors at the time. And basically they chose to license all the patents to a small Japanese company because they were not able to make any money of it. And uh, so the, the, the Japanese company made uh, this first application. It was a transistor radio. So the company was Sony, okay? And it was a very small company at the time, just starting. They, they started with the transistor license and fabricated cheap radios, basically. And this is how they grew. So now, that now they're not in very good shape, but in the 80s and in the 90s were a very big and innovative company. And the other application was this one on the left, which is, is a, basically a hearing aid. You use the transistor for its amplifier qualities, qualities, and then you amplify audio signal for people that have hearing, let's say, difficulties, hearing problems. This was the invention in the 1958. I already mentioned these dates, but uh, I mean, it's just n n nice to see the, the related pictures. These two um, scientists invented the integrated circuit in 1958. They were working in different companies at the time. Mostly they invented the thing at the same time. And the first integrated circuit was that one. You see, it seems really something that you do, let's say, in your home lab, basically, because it's very, very simple and cheap, but it was the first demonstration of the possibility of making a microchip. Then you have, when you have demonstrated the possibility, you can engineer it and make it in an industrial setting and scale up. Okay. Then we, we go here. And here I just want to show you this slide, but we will discuss the issue very much in detail later in, in one of the next few lectures. But now I, I think it is important. You probably have heard about Moore's law. Uh, in the news now, it's become something, let's say, a popular way of describing the improvement in, uh, let's say, semiconductor electronics. But basically, uh, uh, Moore was at the time, in 1965, uh, the uh, chairman and pre no, CEO and president of Intel. And Intel was a small company at the time. Uh, it was small, basically, what they did was mostly DRAMs, okay? SRAMs and DRAMs. They were a memory chip company. And uh, what he did, he presented uh, a talk at the um, International Electric Device Meeting at the time, showing this plot on the right, okay? And the story goes like this. In 1959, we were able to put one transistor on a chip. So this is the power of two. So two to the power of zero is one, okay? In 1962, we were able to put three, uh, the two to the power of three transistor on a chip which is basically the six, uh, uh, the, the, the one bit SRAM that I've shown you at the beginning, okay? In 1963, we were able to put 16. In 1964, 32. In 1965, 64. I do not see any reason we should stop. 
basically he said there is no fundamental physical reason why we should not be able to continue this reduction in size. And then he drew this line and said, okay, we can continue to double the number of transistors per chip every year or so. Okay? This was it, basically. It was a conference. He, he made this prediction, uh, not completely serious, actually, at the time. And, uh, and he had very, very few points. Okay? It was not a law okay, at the time. Actually, what happened is that, uh, okay, let me go, no, what, what, hap uh, what happened is that basically all the semiconductor industry followed this line. Okay, not exactly like this, because uh, there were times in which the, let's say, the improvement was uh, slower, and there were times when the improvement was faster. But m m pretty much followed this, this rule. Uh, not, not ex let's say the average was something like a doubling of the number of transistors every 18 months. Not every 12 months, but every 18 months. But the most important part is not the number of months. It's the fact that you, this means that you have an exponential improvement. Okay? If you double every X months, you, it means that you are improving exponentially. Okay, this is the description of an exponential. Okay. And uh, uh, if you have an exponential, basically you, con you can go whenever you want, if you just wait. Okay. And this is what happened, actually. Okay. From the first six uh, transistor chip, what happened then? There was the first microprocessor. So uh, you should look at these numbers here. Uh, uh, the, the first microprocessor, of course you know why a microprocessor is important, I don't need to tell you. Okay? The first microprocessor was the famous 4004, 4004. And it was uh, uh, designed and uh, fabricated by Intel. It was a PMOS process. PMOS process means that most of the transistors are PMOS and the logic is not a CMOS logic, the logic is built on PMOS transistors. In CMOS logic you have half NMOS and half PMOS. In PMOS logic you, have, you mostly have PMOS. Okay. And the number of transistors was 2300. Okay. So very small number, similar to what is required to run Pong on an Atari machine. And it was a 10 micron process, which means that the channel length of the transistors was about 10 micron. Uh, the nice part about it is that the, the main designer, the chief designer, was Federico Fagin, which is Italian. He's from, uh, I, I think, originally from Trieste. He came to Pisa a few months ago, actually. It is this guy here. Federico Fagin is a physicist by education. Then he went to, to um, first Texas and then California. With, he, he was with Fairchild and then he went to Intel in, in, the, in the 60s. And then he's always been there. He started a few large companies. I mean, it's a, it's a very, it's an impressive success story, even if it's from, let's say, 40 years ago or, or more. Uh, it, and he was in charge of the design of the old microprocessor. Uh, the clock frequency was uh, close to 100 kilohertz, so extremely small, and the dial was 3 by 4 millimeter. So this is a picture of it. It's a very, very simple machine. And uh, the main use was to make a pocket calculator. Okay. This was the pocket calculator. It was called Pocketronic. I mean, this is the 70s. And, uh, and it's a completely different uh, story. Okay. B basically, uh, it, it, it was a one kilogram machine. So you could put it in the you know, briefcase. And it made the four operations. Okay. That, that was it. You had this small uh, um, 
keyboard. Then instead of a display, you have this, uh, let's say, paper strip here, this white one. White one is a paper strip. To, when you re, where you read the, the, the result of your calculation. And then the, this black thing on the back is uh, uh, what contains the board and the memory and all the circuits. Okay. So you should compare it with, uh, with what we have now. It, it, the cost was $150 in the 70s. And if you want to compare with the cost now, you have to multiply by 5.75, which is the, how they call it? the flator is the, is the coefficient that you have to use in order to, let's say, take into account the inflation from 671 to now. So basically, it would be something like $850 now. So the price of, uh, let's say, medium uh, notebook now. OK. Uh, and of course, this was already 71. The scaling continued, and things, already, of, of course, improved. Your question? Or? OK. The things actually improved. And, uh, and uh, of course, we are where we are now. What, what is the reason why we, uh, we the industry, basically um, invested in order to obtain scaling down of transistor size. There are different reasons. We will explore them in, in, in the class. But uh, let me just put some, uh, put some, let's say, things here in, in, in this first introduction. Uh, in order to scale, to increase the, num the, the number of transistors per chip, you need to have larger chips and smaller transistor. Okay? As I said before, especially smaller transistor. Why? There are three reasons, basically. Smaller transistors, three reasons. Yeah. Smaller transistors, two reasons, let's say. One is that smaller transistors are faster. This is not obvious. And it's not exactly true now, but up to now has been true. And if you have faster transistor, you can have a shorter time Per operation, and which, this means that you can increase the clock frequency. Okay, as I said before, the 4004 microprocessor of 71 had a clock frequency of 100 kilohertz. Okay, now it is common to have a clock frequency above one gigahertz. Of course, so this is only possible because you have much smaller transistors which switch faster okay the other thing is that you can have better micro architectures of course if you have 2000 transistors you can do little thing few things with them when you have 1 billion transistors you can build complex architectures and of course obtain more instructions per cycle so both things are important I must say that at the beginning, from the 70s to the uh, 80s, the first one was the most important one, from the, because there were no uh, computer tools to design uh, microchips. So if you had to do everything by hand, basically you couldn't do things too complex. In the 80s, there were the possibility of having computer tools to help you in the, in the design. And then you could build more complex microarchitectures. And so the two things became more or less similarly important. Now, we will discuss this thing in detail. Basically, it's very, very hard to gain in speed. You probably have already noticed, if you follow the market and the things that go out, that basically, uh, until 2005, 2006, every year you had a record clock frequency. At some point in 2005, we had the first uh, microprocessor above one gigahertz in clock frequency, and then more or less everything stopped. 
because uh, we, we now have less than three. So basically, there was, a, uh, let, let's say, a fast improvement up to 2005, and now everything is more or less constant. And uh, well, we, this is something that you have noticed. The reason is energy consumption, because when you go faster, you, of course, have a much higher energy consumption, and this limits the, 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 the in practice, the possibility of running the, micro the microprocessor faster. And so now everything is focused on improving the macroarchitecture and increasing, for example, for example, the numbers of core, the number of cores that you have in parallel, or the, the, the size of the cache, for example. You, you, you can spend in transistors easily, but you cannot improve the clock frequency anymore. Let me stop this. Now, there is another thing that I would like to uh, draw your attention on, is uh, uh, the end of this scaling. Because, uh, um, of course, I will, um, this is something on which we will, again, um, come back, but uh, uh, this prediction by Morse about the scaling of uh, uh, transistors actually was uh, uh, very bold and uh, at, at the time actually anybody thought, everybody thought that at some time this exponential growth will stop. Okay, But this, uh, let's say, um, moment has been pushed uh, in time very a uh, few times already pushed uh, pushed down in time a few times already for example in, in the 80s it was very uh, common in the technical literature to read that uh, there will be diminishing returns so the the incentive to reduce the size will be reduced below 0 0.5 micron in transistor size this was something that was very clearly discussed in the 80s. And actually, the wall at 0 0.5 micron was, let's say, broken, and the progress continued. Then in the 90s, it was very, I mean, many, many people said, OK, it's not convenient to go beyond 0 0.25 micron, the, the quarter micron, the quarter micron let's say, wall. And it's impossible to go below 0 0.1 micron. Okay? And this is more or less the time I started working on this subject. And I remember very clearly, uh, the, let's say, this, this issue was discussed uh, a lot, and people were trying to say, OK, what do we do next? Then, of course, also this wall was broken. In 2000, very, I mean, for me, it, it's uh, yesterday, uh, 2000, and uh, uh, no, nobody can go below f 50 nanometer in size. It was pretty clear. Again, lots of discussion, but that even this was broken. In 2010, which is two minutes ago, <laughs> it was the, 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 this, this uh, limit was 10 nanometer. This has not been broken yet. Okay, uh, let's say my feeling is that we will go down to five. But now, for the moment, this is a real, uh, this is, let's say, an obstacle which is still uh, in front of us. Uh, what happened, actually? Why it, it was possible to, to, to break all these uh, um, predictions? Uh, I will give you a hint about it. Uh, and uh, before doing that, I will, would like to show you again the graph of Morse law, the number of transistors per die. A die is uh, um, um, let's say actually a small tablet of, of silicon, uh, a small tile okay, of, of, of silicon as a function of um, the uh, production years. So this green part 
is exactly corresponding to the points that I've already shown you in the previous figure. And this dotted line would be the, uh, let's say, uh, the uh, continuation, the extrapolation of that exponential. And this uh, uh, orange and red dots are actual points. Where the technology went, particularly it was Intel technology in microprocessors for the orange lines and for memory. And you can see what has told you, that basically the slope was different, sometimes below that, sometimes above that, but uh, more or less the exponential behavior more was maintained. I, this is a semi-log scale. You have a log scale on the vertical axis and the linear scale on the horizontal axis. So it's, by definition, a semi-log scale. And a line on a semi-log scale is an exponential in a, in a linear scale. So this is where we are now. Okay, this was this is pretty old actually, it's from 2005. But basically, the the the, the line has continued without changing uh, the slope. Uh, this is look, th this is the same thing seen from the other side. The reduction in size for a single transistor. Uh, you, you 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 can see the numbers there really impressive because. 2005, the one that I showed you before, be, uh, smaller than a virus, the channel length was something close to 30 nanometers. Now we are something, actually things changed a bit after 2009, we are something like here still, around 15 nanometer in channel length. Okay, this is where we are now and it, it's really, I mean, if you consider that a virus is one of the smallest things that we, that we have in nature, this is really, really smaller than that. What, what happened in, in the last few years? I think this is uh, interesting from a cultural point of view because uh, for, for the time we have now, I don't want to go into some uh, quantitative aspect. Let, let, let me finish with this. So what happened in the last few years? Basically, uh, as I mentioned, people were really skeptical about the possibility of reducing below 50 nanometer the size of a transistor. And they were right. It was very, very hard to reduce the size of a transistor be be below 50 nanometers. But a lot of things have changed. So. The, the, there have been at least three revolutions in the way of fabricating transistors. And these revolutions have made possible the transistors we have now. Just to uh, have a look at that. This is a 0.13 micron transistor. Okay? Uh, this uh, dimension, 0.13, is uh, more or less, a, 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 let's say, a definition, the actual channel length is the one that is showed here in red, is 70 nanometers, 0 0.07 micron. Okay, this is a normal MOSFET. You can recognize it easily. This part, this is the gate here. This is, for example, the source. This is the drain. This is the channel. This is the gate. Okay, there's a distance between the channel and the contact, but, but more or less it's the same thing, there's just an extension from the actual metal contact to the beginning of the, of, the, of, the, of the gate. So this is a very normal transistor. If you compare this one with the transistor of 20 years before, more or less the only thing that changed significantly, significantly is the size. It's just reduced in size. Then something happened. And uh, what happened is that they had to change the materials and to change the shape. And everything starts from 2003. Okay, look at this uh, sequence here. In 2003, the technology was called 90 nanometer. The channel length was about uh, 50 nanometer, okay, more or less. 
Basically, they had to modify the material. Instead of using silicon, they had to strain silicon. So basically, they use a, a compressive for the PMOS and the tensile strain for the NMOS. Basically, they modify the crystalline structure by, 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 by straining. Okay? By straining and modifying the, the crystalline structure, they are able to change the, prop the physical properties of silicon and uh, especially to change the mobility of electrons and the mobility of holes. You can improve the mobility of electrons by straining with a tensile strain the silicon and you can improve the mobility of holes by compressing the silicon and this is this is what they started doing of course it's a revolution because you are changing the material okay and a, as you can imagine it's not easy to do and this uh, uh, basically uh, the, this is what uh, uh, what, what I was telling uh, the, for the N MOSFET, you make a tensile strain, and for the P MOSFET, uh, here you make a compressive strain. How do you do that? Basically, for the tensile strain, you, you deposit on top of the transistor another material which has a different uh, elastic, uh, um, no, which has a different. Uh, um, I'm, I'm missing, I don't, I don't find the word. I don't remember the word. Uh, no, I don't remember the word. It, it, basically, the, the mm, I don't. M maybe I'm wrong. But maybe it's called uh, temperature dilatation constant. I'm not not sure. I'm really missing the word. Basically, the the, the constant with which tells you how the, 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 the size increases with any temperature increase. Okay? So that when, when, when you, you deposit the, the, this yellow cover material at a high temperature and you let the temperature decrease, there is some strain in the system. Okay? And, and the, the other way is done for PMOSFETs. Anyway, the, the main concept to understand is that they change the nature of the materials in order to change the mobility of electrons and holes, and it works. Now, and it, it, this was done in 2003 and 2005, and uh, it's in mainstream silicon technology. Now, every single transistor has strained silicon. Be because it's, uh, an it, it's, called a, it's an important performance booster. It's a, it's a fundamental performance booster. You need it. Okay. Then in 2007, another revolution was introduced. Basically, the silicon oxide, the electric, was removed. Uh, you know probably that the, only re the main reason we use silicon for transistors is the fact that in the 50s, it was clear that silicon had the best oxide to use as a dielectric in the most transistors. So the main reason we used silicon is that we wanted silicon oxide. In 2007, silicon oxide was removed, basically. And it was substituted with other oxides, which were uh, basically which allowed to reduce the thickness of the oxide, the effective thickness of the oxide, without increasing the leakage current through the gate. Okay? So if you look at the picture, this is impressive. O here on the left is a MOS with the silicon oxide. You know, MOS metal is the gate, 
oxide, the silicon oxide layer, and silicon. This is the MOS uh, uh, system. This is what is normal. And look, this is a TM picture. These dots are the single atoms. Okay, these are silicon atoms, these dots here. These are silicon and oxygen atoms. It's a, an amorphous material, so it, it's not very regular. And this is again, the gate is polysilicon, so it's again a type of silicon. Now, what they did is uh, using these different oxides, the so-called high K materials, where high K means high dielectric constant material, which had a high, a, a high capacitance per unit area with a, a larger thickness. And the material was completely different because basically in this case they used hafnium oxide. Hafnium is a rare material, much, much rarer than silicon, of course, that uh, changed completely the MOS, and the MOS stack. So in this case, we have, from 2007, we have silicon here, hafnium oxide here, and on the top, instead of uh, silicon, we have uh, some uh, uh, combination of different metals. It's a very complex combination of different metals. And this was necessary to reduce leakage. Leakage is the current through the gate. Of course, in an MOS, in a MOSFET, you don't want current through the gate. But if the, if the oxide is uh, thin, and of course it becomes thin when you reduce everything, then you start to have leakage current. So let's go back here. 2003, strained silicon. 2004, and seven high K dielectric and metal gate, and 2011 vertical transistor, a tri-gate transistor, the, 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 the third revolution in the fabrication of transistors. Uh, this is a, a modern transistor. This, pro this fabrication process was introduced by Intel in 2011 you, this shape of transistor is called FinFET. Fin is, uh, uh, the, the, let's say, the fin of, uh, of, uh, uh, of a fish, okay? Because basically the channel is vertical and the gate uh, is around three sides of the fin. So it's not, not, not anymore something planar with the get on top. You, you see it's completely different in shape. Now, instead of having the channel in this direction and then on top the dielectric and on top the gate, you have the channel in this direction, the dielectric around for three sides, and the gate again around. And the reason to do that was to improve the let's say the electrostatic control of the channel by the gate, because you surround completely the gate. So this process was introduced, as I said, by Intel in 2011, and now it is, let's say, the, the state of the art. All the, the um, advanced processors have this type of transistors. And again, this type of transistor have strained silicon plus high K dielectric plus fin shape. Three gate. Gate on the three sides of the channel. So only because of these improvements in terms of material and in materials and in terms of geometry, of shape, it was possible to break the 50 nanometer barrier. So something actually has changed in the last few years. Until 10 years ago, it was just a matter of fabricating transistors smaller and smaller and to find a way to use them. Okay? In, the, in the last 10 years, it's mostly a matter of changing the materials, changing the geometry to push down again the transistors and then you try to find a use for billions of transistors that you have for the billions of transistors that you have okay ah, okay 
this is just just a picture to show you uh, what is uh, uh, um, what's inside a microprocessor a modern microprocessor this is a 22 nanometer trigate uh, the microprocessor with with trigate transistors this is from intel in 2012 okay so the the no two, not 2012 2000 and the two, 22 nanometer in production went in 2014 so at the end of last year this is a four core processor one two three four there's the cache the the, the, the l3 cache they each of these cores have uh, an internal cache then they have all a shared cache uh, basically, these are um, chips. Uh, these are parts of circuits for display, for memory controller, and other stuff. And this is a graphics processor. Okay. Again, the structure is very modular, and we will go a bit into the detail. But you can see that the most regular parts are the memories. So these are all memories. This green part, but also this part. In, the, in each core are memories, or the regular part are banks of memories. Okay. There are three cache levels, L1, L2, and L3. L1 and L2 are inside each core, L3 is shared, and then we go out. Okay. So, hmm. I okay. Just want to finish with some numbers, just to put things in perspective, and then we will let's say look at the circuits starting from next time. Uh, to, it's important to um, understand the numbers. So uh, these are numbers from last year, to 2014. Uh, just to put things into perspective, this is the global GDP gross domestic product the, the same thing that in in Italy we call PIL Prodotto Interno Lordo in English is GDP this is global so is over the whole world and it's in dollars 76 trillions okay 1 trillion is 1000 billion so, if you look at electronic systems, the global production of electronic systems has a value of 1.5 trillions. So, it is something like 2%, okay, close to 2% of the whole global GDP. That is electronic systems, the thing we are talking in this course. In addition to that, you need to add the, the global um, uh, the, the, the global, um, let's say, turnover of services based on electronic systems, which will be additional five trillion dollars globally. I don't want to include that because I just want to focus on the hardware now, on stuff. The uh, large part of this uh, uh, electronic systems market is the global semiconductor market. When we say semiconductor market, we mean uh, microchips, integrated circuits, and devices, single transistors. Okay, for some applications, you don't buy an integrated circuit, you buy one transistor. For power applications, you have a transistor which is this big, so you buy one. And the, the market is Basically, 25% of the global electronics market is $353 billion, okay? And part of it is, uh, uh, a good part of it is the equipment. Semiconductor capital spending is basically the equipment and the building required to make the integrated circuit and devices production, okay? Which is still a large number, $65 billion globally. So this is the, the market we're talking about. And uh, uh, the other thing that I think from the general point of view it's interesting to know is 
the cost of one advanced fab. One fab able to, for example, fabricate the 22 nanometer chips by Intel has a cost now of about five billion. Okay. Five billion dollars is a lot of money, of course, and this is the reason why there are so few uh, actual fabs around and the total industry is concentrated in very few global players. In, I'm, I'm always mentioning Intel because it's the largest one, okay? And, uh, and, but there are actually few of them. In Europe, we have three players. Uh, the largest one is STM, ST Microelectronics, which is, uh, let's say, half French and half Italian, okay? In France, they say that it's Fran French, <laughs> in Italian. In Italy, we say that it is Italian, but more or less, it's a half and half. And uh, then there is uh, um, Infineon, which is a German company. And then there is NXP, which is a Dutch company. Uh, in principle, it's Dutch, then uh, n n now it's, uh, I mean, it's basically owned by uh, uh, a private equity in, in the US, but the, the, the headquarters are in Europe. Okay, now uh, let's look at the global electronic systems market here just to finish and uh, uh, just to, I, I want to justify why I choose the smartphone as the reference electronic systems. Okay, I need to justify because if I, if one does not know the numbers, one can think really that this is just a gadget, okay? but actually is the most important part of the electronic systems market. L look at this picture here. This is the global market, and these are the first 10 categories in terms of size in the market, okay? So uh, how you should interpret this, uh, this uh, uh, plot? You can see that uh, the size of the dot is the size of the market is proportional to the size of the market, okay? Then, uh, the, on the vertical axis, you have the share of systems sale. These are data from 2013, but more or less the, th the, 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 um, the percentages are the same, okay? So the higher, the most important part of the market, okay? And then, on the y-axis is the uh, so-called CAGR or, or CAGR, which means the compound annual growth rate. So the higher is the one that is growing faster. So for example, here on, on the right, we have 21%, which means a growth of 21% per year in these five years, from 2012 to 2017. So, you, you can see here clearly that cell phones are the highest in terms of share of system sale. And it's more or less 20, uh, something like uh, uh, I mean a little bit less than 20%. Okay, it's higher than PC. And th this became higher in 2011. In 2011, the market for cell phones, uh, let's say, was first and was before the one for standard PC. Then digital TVs is a large market, less interesting probably, automotive. And then there is this other market which for which something is changed. This is the one for tablets. But if you look inside, a tablet is very, very close to a cell phone, of course, because cell phones now are for the 80% smartphones. So basically, it, it's the same thing as a tablet, okay? In terms of equipment inside, it's basically the same thing. So this is the reason why I said, okay, let's talk about cell phones, okay? It's also f more fun because you have sensors inside and on Sardar PC, basically, you don't have all that stuff. So it is the most important category in the electronics systems market, and this is the reason why we talk about it. 
this is the same thing but it is not as a, as a percentage of the total semi of the total electronic systems market but is a percentage of a total integrated circuits market so integrated circuits for cell phones are the, the largest category in integrated circuits again okay so it's not just the electronic systems but also if you look only at the chips 22 percent of the all chips produced globally are used in telephones and in particular in smartphones okay again you, you see here you have cell phones then you have pcs and then you have all the rest okay the rest is actually uh, much smaller in size uh, this is something that i already told you if you plot the shipments of unit this is not the price this is the shipments of unit smartphones versus pcs <coughs> you can see here of course the pcs started a lot earlier but then in terms of unit sales in 2011 uh, the number of uh, smartphones sold was larger than the numbers of pcs sold and then the difference is still increasing this is more or less constant is not increasing anymore this is going up sharply as you probably know the number of tablets sold is going down in the last uh, year strangely it has gone down and basically the reason is that these large smartphones are let's say taking the market of tablets okay now we can save the tear down for next time okay see you next time